Uh, to this day, nobody, we still don't know who the Dow attacker is. Um, Taylor, how did you feel with all that optimism and, and community and then this starts happening? I saw the either the Reddit post or like Griff's message linking to the Reddit post uh, on my way up to to my my friend's cabin, and so literally I saw the post, and then my like I had no cell service until we made it to the cabin, and I was just sitting there like, what is going on? Um, I think that it was it was really weird because there was this just like your stomach just drops out when when this happened like that day the next day like you just have this pit in in your stomach that's just like this is not this is not good this is really 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 bad um and and it was pretty like you know that pit comes from the helplessness of it too um but pretty quickly um it became obvious that like even though this terrible event had happened um there were a lot of like things that needed to be done and so that's where I focus my energy. Like I was like, okay, like let's not be buttholes to each other. Uh, the world is watching, <laughs> um, and let's see what we can resolve. And uh, you know, we we're investigating like the child dows and people who had split before and people who had split after. And you know, there there was all these things to be done. And then obviously the decision about the fork had to be discussed. And there was the soft fork versus the hard fork, and on and on and on. And so. I really don't think that it hit me sort of like the lasting, you know, the lasting impact of the DAO didn't hit me. Um, I never sold my DAO tokens. Like I've, 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 with, like I've traded some of them, like withdrawn some of them, but uh, I still have to this day DAO tokens because I was like, I might need them to test the interface or something. Um, I know a lot of people like sold immediately or like, you know, they were withdrawing when the price of ETH, you know, went up to a thousand, but like, I don't know. It's it's weird, right? It's like a delayed reaction. I think I'm still learning from the Dow and the mistakes that were made, um, or even the mistakes that, like you know, these unforeseen circumstances that aren't necessarily mistakes. You know, what can be learned? And and something that's really in favor of the Ethereum community is that. Everybody started coming together and working together to, to do something about this. Um, Griff, you started that um, immediately by trying to figure out who was in the child, the, the identities of people in the child DAOs. Um, and that sort of grew into the effort that became the Robin Hood group. Um, you know, in the wider community, like um, Vitalik and everybody started discussing, you know, soft fork, hard fork options. Um, but Griff, can you kind of take us into what it was like to be on those chats with um, as the Robin Hood group formed. And just for anybody who doesn't know, these are the guys, this was all kind of behind the scenes at the time. I, I'm not sure if many people knew about this, but there were like a group of hackers and coders who were very actively trying to figure out who had done this and, and to figure out the hack itself. And maybe Griff, you could just kind of take us into what that Friday was like for you. fun than the previous three weeks. Goon gave me a lot of problems with his moratorium and we had, a, we had a lot of banging our head against the wall to try to move the DAO forward. But once the DAO got hacked, it was obvious what we had to do. We, there, were, there were very few choices. So it was clear action. Uh, we had to get the, we had to tell everyone first off, to, you know, and make sure that everyone's aware that this is Okay, I can't, it's Griff cutting out. Right. Right. was script to do it while we started hunting down the curator. The different, different, there were different people who had roles uh, in the, these child DAOs that we needed to hunt down, like who made the, up being 
the, the, the person who approves proposals in that DAO, if we can get those keys uh, and if we can keys in any other future DAOs to make sure that we have control of all the exits, all the possible holes in the DAO. We wanted to, uh, a, a group of uh, trusted Ethereum hackers got together to, to try to per stop the bleeding. And uh, we weren't very successful at stopping the bleeding, honestly. Uh, but at, at one point, it just stopped. Uh, several hours later, it, they, the hacker only took about 30% of, of the DAO to, of the Ether in the DAO and then just stopped. And we weren't sure exactly why. Uh, but we studied the code and we figured out how to hack the DAO. Actually, two different people within our group found created two different hack contracts. And so then we started draining the DAO before anyone else figured it out. So the DAO hacker took 30% and we took the other 70% and made sure that we were in control of this ether. Uh, the the like almost dumb luck security uh, protection of the DAO was that when you create, when you pull money out of the DAO, it actually goes into a child DAO. And then that child DAO, it's stuck there for 28 days until the DAO has had its own token creation event. And then after that, you have, you have 14 days to pull money out through a proposal because there was a proposal time limit. So, they, so we had 42 days before the money could get into an account. Uh, for the hard fork, we had 35 days before the, uh, the hacker could actually split the DAO and move, the, move it to another DAO and to a different address. And so we had all sorts of crazy plans. You know, we were, we were going to buy tokens in the dark DAO. We, uh, we had control of all the curators. And uh, eventually, there, the reason we actually even started hacking was because uh, we were perfecting our hack contracts to hack the DAO. Uh, and then we were waiting for someone else to hack the DAO because we weren't sure of the legal situation if we started hacking. Uh, and so we wanted to be sort of pushed into it uh, to hack the DAO. So there are actually probably about eight or nine different DAOs. Point and, and draw it out. So I think everybody heard the story that Griff just gave. And... Uh, this is, I think, it captures the true essence of a decentralized system. I think there are a lot of people out there who say all sorts of things about every other, every other chain, calling it, you know, centralized, you know, whatever. And for the case of Ethereum, King Vitalik was a, was a phrase that was used often in that time frame. And Vitalik was reduced to spamming the chain himself. And I remember these discussions that Griff just went through. And look at the convoluted things that he just mentioned. That's what it means to, to not have control. Even the people who wrote the code are using only those interfaces open to the public to interact with it. So it, these, these decentralized systems are amazing and they have a life of their own. And really what we had, I think, was, uh, was a story of robot versus man, right? Robots got some kind of issue. It's a weird kind of robot, doesn't really have physical form, but it's, it's gone haywire and now you have to take control of it. So I just want to bring that out. Um, it kind of gets lost in the process, but it was not at all a centralized system. It was all a bunch of volunteers trying to do their best. Thing here is uh, not a lot of people know there were several attacks on the DAO. There wasn't just the one, and Griff just alluded to it. So Friday, that Friday contract uh, attack got a lot of ether. That was the main one, about fifty-five million dollars worth. Then it stopped. The the, the Robinhood group assembled and got their contracts ready, their, their hack ready. But like I said, they were like, they didn't, they were worried about the legality of pushing the button about hacking this thing themselves. Then on Tuesday after the attack on June 21st, they didn't have a choice because a second attack began. And um, it started drawing um, thousands of ether out of the DAO and um, became the second biggest attack, uh, hack with about 250,000 ether stolen. So that's when they all jumped into it. Uh, Um, and so, um, that, it, and then, um, there's a great backstory, just, uh, again, the community, what the, ha what the Robin Hood group needed was a lot of DAO tokens. The more DAO tokens you had, the quicker you could drain the DAO. So they all pooled their resources. They had about 600,000. Then they got in touch with Ryan Zurer and some others. And, and, and soon they had millions of DAO tokens because 
everyone in the community was like, yeah, of course I'll help. And once they had that, um, I think Griff, you said to me that you, you were pulling out a million ETH at a time and it only took a couple of hours to drain that 70%, which is, which is amazing. Um, and so, but one thing uh, that I, I just real quickly interject here is that attacker on the 21st, uh, it got mad at you guys and sent an encrypted message to you um, once the uh, idea of like a soft fork or a hard fork was really coalescing. And um, I got, so it, it was from an account that was in, initiated the, the second attack. And he wrote to you guys, um, in the Robinhood group, and then somebody uh, shared this unencrypted message with me. I, I don't think there are many people in the world who have ever seen this outside of, of you guys, Griff. But so I'll read it, and I think uh, just real quick, the syntax is weird. It, it might be on purpose. We're not sure, but it says this soft fork and the DAO wars situation is waste of time for everyone. I'm supporting the idea that code is law at smart contract, but also the network consensus is law on blockchain. So then he talks about his dark child DAO, and he says, I'll basically give this DAO money back to the curator if Ethereum, uh, if, if you guys do it too. And he says, don't you do it also to see productive future. So you guys were getting under his skin. Um, I guess they expected to get away with it, but um, that wasn't the case. And then maybe real quick, we could just jump to you, you, you uh, in a couple of weeks' time, you were hosting your your um, coding camp at Cornell, and, and the fork was approaching. And, and basically, real short, short story short, uh, the hard fork was the only option. Basically, had been the consensus at this point. But maybe you could take us through that. It happened on that in that time frame. So uh, first of all, there was the big discussion around: do we fork or not? And uh, that came down to is code law or do these systems serve human purposes? And um, that was a really interesting discussion. And uh, for me, the high point of this was there was a group of us uh, at Cornell, uh, Vitalik, Vlad, um, uh, Alex van der Sand uh, and um, uh, Martin Beze. Uh, we were all si sitting around and, um, and I remember looking at them and saying, look, guys, if, if you are going after of uh, the dark money flows, then you cannot fork, right? If, if your goal is to go after illegal, illicit flows, then you have to just, just obey stuff. And it's okay, I'm not a judgmental person. If that's what you're doing, that's fine. But if you really wanna go after this world computer thing, then if, if you really mean that, then you can totally fork. So which one is it? And without thinking, without a millisecond, everyone said it's the latter. It is not the case that we want to be, you know, we are not trying to be the Bitcoin of the world. We're not trying to go after these darker money flows. We're not trying to be da, da, da. We have a different mission. And so, so that was a very interesting moment for me. Uh, fast forward a tiny bit. There, the plan was use a soft fork to freeze and then a hard fork to, to take back the funds. And, um, and life was kind of going uh, according to plan. Soft fork code had been written and approved by a bunch of people. And um, I received an email from, uh, from someone, uh, from a high school student. And this was a student I had corresponded with about a year ago. And he wrote a very nice message. He said, well, you know, in the fall, I wrote to you about which schools to apply to. I applied to Cornell. I got in. I'm going to be a freshman at Cornell. Uh, but by the way, I have been thinking about the fork situation. And isn't it the case that if they actually apply the soft fork patch, then it's going to open a giant denial of service attack on Ethereum itself. And this was an amazing discovery. It was new to me as well. So I wrote a, I co-authored a blog post with a high school student and his other friend uh, who was a freshman at Columbia University at the time. So uh, these are my youngest collaborators, by the way. And, um, and we wrote something that says, hey, soft work is actually a D D D uh, DOS uh, attack vector. And um, it turns out that Ethereum is quite censorship resistant because the types of things that you can do in other uh, blockchains are much harder to do in Ethereum because of its Turing complete nature. You have to execute stuff. And if you want to censor things, well, you will have executed things and you will then have to toss them out if you want to censor. And that can be very costly for, for people who want to do that. So we wrote a blog, blog post to this effect. Um, it had a mixed, uh, mixed series of reactions. Uh, the, the value of Ethereum at the time was about 1B. And um, 
uh, this was unexpected, and it was a reversal of the, the Ethereum high brass, if you will, because everybody thought this was doable. And so the value of, of Ether dropped by about 10%. So it was a $100 million blog post is what we called it internally. And I wrote a, a message saying, hey, Vitalik, sorry about this. And he wrote back, no, no, no. To the contrary, it, it preserved 900M. So it's really a $900 million <laughs> blog post as opposed to a minus 100. So soft work was taken off the table. And then there was a big, big discussion around the hard fork. And that was a community-led discussion. Look, um, that it surprised me that um, looking back on it, obviously you guys could have assumed that everybody, you know, the way that the hard fork was implemented was an update to the software. Pretty much everybody had to update. You could assume that maybe everyone would 100%, but why assume that and, and why you know that there was there was one mining pool in China that didn't uh, update, so they kept mining on the old chain, and that's where we get Ether Classic from. And it seems like to me that maybe Ethereum is, is, I think, a lot of nice people, a lot of really good intentions, but maybe that that gets in their way sometimes. And here they could have been a little more battle hardened. I just wondered if anybody has a thought on that and whether the fork was. Should it have been more expected, and should you have should people have thought more about what to do if this happens? Just a, a fairly universally held um, sort of like thought, right? Was was the theory that the longest chain wins? That was it. It's been around forever. That was like that's what everyone thought, and so. Um, if you look back at, at the conversations happening on the forums and on Reddit, um, that was just reiterated again and again and again. Like, even if it forks, um, the longest chain will win. Um, and it's really hard to take yourself back to that time because today it's so obvious that, like, you no, know, both chains can totally exist. And why wouldn't they exist if it gives you free money? Right, it's so obvious. Why didn't we see it back then? I mean, someone saw it, right? Because it didn't, even though there was this one mining pool that was mining it, uh, which by the way happens usually every single fork, you know, contentious or not, there's always like someone who forgets to update or just doesn't update. Um, you know, but but what, what gave Ethereum Classic its initial value, what gave the two chains, like each of them having value was I think when Poloniex listed it, which was a couple of days later. And so, um, you know, like, should people have seen it coming? Yeah, because if we think about the incentives, you know, any number of people who held a massive amount of Ethereum at the time were incentivized to create free money out of thin air via this fork. Um, and, you know, it, it is what it is. I think that's another lesson to be learned is like, uh, the second you're certain about something, you should be less certain. frontier still exists you know so who cares but uh but then and then when polo listed it it's like wow that's gonna that's gonna get ugly you know and just watch people dump but then the amazing thing was that people were buying it and and then we saw what we what we ice kind of saw was like bitcoiners wanted to maintain or my theory on it is that bitcoiners believed in the code is law theory and that actually this Ethereum is better than that Ethereum, so it will win in the long run. And there became a community there. And uh, uh, Goon, I see you shaking your head. I feel like you got something to say. 
exactly right. I was just shaking my head at, uh, at the, the sentiment that was expressed. I've always been against that. These monetary systems only have value to the extent they serve people. Code is not law. Code is buggy. Law is law. And uh, that's where we are. That's why we, were, we are here today. Um, but one of the things that I guess I could add to this is uh, what happened when we were sitting around, um, again, with the same crew. And, um, and Vitalik was reading his email, looked up and said, oh, look at this. I got a message. And I'm not going to name the developer, but everybody will know, uh, from a prominent Bitcoin core developer, uh, one who's famous mostly for his social manipulation, I think. It was just sad, but true. And, um, and he said, look, here is, uh, here is this person trying to buy my coins on the old chain. And uh, we all looked at each other and said, that's really strange. Um, and, uh, and of all people to try to buy Vitalik's coins, um, we, we, it was very clear that this was, this was an overt act of slapping someone in the face with a glove to say, I, I and a bunch of people that, that are uh, coordinating with me are, uh, are trying to create value behind the old chain. And it really was, I think, Griff, you were right. It really was a Bitcoin versus Ethereum uh, kind of a mentality clash. It was very much a culture clash. So for Bitcoin and its purpose in life, code must be law. Bitcoin cannot do these kinds of things, although it did in its history as well. It did all sorts of funny things to, to back its way out of bugs. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but, but the Bitcoiners felt that nobody else could, right? That, that the latecomers had to be held to a higher standard and that they also felt that the, the latecomers had to actually uphold their, their values. They did not appreciate the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin. And I think even to this day, they don't. They think that these systems are diametrically opposed. They think that they're playing for the same market. They don't understand that these systems actually have different value propositions and different domains that they're targeting. So, um, so that was, I think, one of the things I learned there. And, um, and so this really was that message was really a slap in the face and was, okay, we're going to put some synthetic value in here and we will see what kind of a community we can develop. And um, uh, the, the Slock It Slack or the DAO Slack, which originally was the Slock It Slack, uh, it, it, uh, it was for three days, it was fine after the hack. People were having coherent discussions and everything was great. And then thousands of random people came in and just started spamming all sorts of hate and saying things are going wrong and da da da. And all of a sudden, they just came in like three days after the hack and flooded all of our communication channels and started effectively uh, ruining any kind of culture that we could maintain. And uh, I found out later about this thing called the Dragon's Den, which I'm pretty sure was uh, activated to attack the DAO community and the Ethereum community and make the most of this, uh, of this misfortune. Um, it sounds like Goon agrees. Whose community was born out of the DAO really matter five years later. <laughs> Are there any lessons about community decisions from the DAO Bitcoin can learn? chain and they can have their own values and if i'm going to if i'm going to create a dark market i'm going to do it on ethereum classic you know and that's and that's great uh it, i really hope that all these chains just get bridged to each other and every and every community can control their own destiny like i would say maybe late 2017 and and in the last couple of years have managed to add some unique value uh, specifically with some of the, like, you know, hardcore FOSS projects, like free open source projects that weren't finding funding or money with Ethereum. Like they were able to, <laughs> they're able to build stuff for quote unquote Ethereum classic, which then can be used to grow the Ethereum um, community or platform or whatever. So that's really, really interesting because um, you, that's weird, right? Like it should be the other way around. Um, I think it also serves as a good reminder of um, obviously what happened and that different philosophies do exist. And that if you don't like what the law is in this new decentralized world, you can 
you can fork out. Well, Taylor, why don't you take this and what lessons should be learned, what have, have been learned and, and what should be learned still about this? And if, if there is a new wave of um, decentralized applications coming out. But I think the biggest lessons that we've learned are, can be applied to like all smart contracts or, or any, any code anywhere. Um, you know, like the biggest lessons that, that I've taken away is like, um, the unexpected can and will happen. Um, even if you have literally all the smartest guys in the room, looking at the code, writing the code, auditing the code, um, things can slip by. This is a really, really new ecosystem. And even though we've evolved a lot since the DAO, um, it's, there's still gaping holes that nobody has thought about, especially when we think about the interoperability between all these different components of the system. And so if you're building a DAO or a Balao or uh, writing code anywhere, you know, where it's dealing with, with an immense amount of money and immense amount of, you know, individual people's money, um, you should be aware of the consequences um, and, and perhaps consider uh, putting in some mechanisms to, uh, you know, like a big old button to say pause, you know, in the cases that something goes wrong, because I can assure you that things will go wrong. Um, even if you are the best code in the world, like they will go wrong. And when the incentives are so high for a malicious actors to attack something, uh, they'll go wrong way more quickly than you think. One of the good, great things that came out of the DAO was the uh, renewed interest in formal verification. So that has been, uh, I think, found everywhere now. All of the smart contracts need to be audited, as Griff mentioned earlier. Um, and and it's, uh, I think the Ethereum community is quite well aware of this. I think blockchain communities in general are now seeing the value of, of formal mechanisms for checking correctness of code. So that's one big issue. Um, going forward, there are still unsolved issues in the design of DAOs. So if you ask me whether or not we could do the DAO safely today, um, I would say no. I think there are some outstanding problems that are really, really hard. You're trying to elicit from the crowd their true feelings, and this is not easy. You can identify a set of problems you face. You can come up with one range of, or uh, one set of mechanisms to address them, and that brings its own secondary attacks that are possible. And you have to iterate this to conclusion, and it hasn't been done in the research community. This is not a topic that has been uh, ignored previously. There have been economists, there have been game theorists who have been looking at this, and this, the problem uh, is unsolved, especially when the same people are both on the voter side and the beneficiary side. So today you don't have this problem. When you run a VC fund, you don't have the same fellow sitting on the board of the VC also appearing in front of the VC uh, with a project in his hand. You don't have that self-dealing thing. And uh, with a DAO and, and in the context of a blockchain, you have it every day. And that really complicates the scenarios. So it's really a fundamentally difficult problem. Um, the types of things that I have seen uh, are, are beginning to address some of the issues, but not all. And, uh, and the legality, of course, is uh, very complicated. And um, I, I suspect it will be very difficult to solve the issues in the DAO without solving some issues related to identity on blockchains as well. So I'm looking forward to progress on those fronts before I can say, OK, we're ready to tackle DAO version 2.0. But DAO version 1.5, I'm excited about. There's still great work to be done in the meantime. really excited about uh which is uh using cad cad to start simulating some of these projects or any simulation software i'm just a, a fan of cad cad because it's really nice open source stuff and and i think people are starting to ag agree that we can't just treat this like a website 
there has been a mentality in the in the blockchain space that we're building. We're we're going to use the same ideas that we used in computer science. When really we need to understand that we're building public infrastructure that anybody can use. It's like a bridge, and if you build a crappy bridge and you don't put in the time to design it and make sure it can what it can withstand and and watch it and monitor it to make sure it's not misused, then you're going to hurt people. And uh, so we need to take the same approach that people have been using to build bridges and build public infrastructure that anyone can access. And uh, that means don't write a white paper and then build a billion dollar economy. It means you write a white paper and then you validate your design and you iterate and iterate for maybe years before you actually launch something to the public. You talk to smart people like Goon and, and you get some outside input on the potential problems with the system. And you uh, I, ideally you uh, implement uh, you know, escape hatches and other centralizing security features that will mitigate issues that you don't perceive. Yeah. Of you guys to tell us something that you've never told anybody else about the DAO and that experience that you had. Um, to give you a minute to think, uh, I think for me it was the person who shared that encrypted message with me because we knew that that was a bad address to begin with, but that kind of connected to me. For me, I was able to um, find sources at, at an exchange and link uh, a withdrawal from that exchange through Shapeshift onto the blockchain to that address that sent the encrypted message. So that allowed me um, in the reporting for my book to kind of find someone associated with one of the DAO attacks. Um, so after a lot of searching, it always bothered me that the, that we don't know who did the DAO attack. Um, I, I don't know. I just, I just want to know the end. Of, I want to know that side of the story, to be honest. I think it would be fascinating. It was such an elegant attack and um, they really just, it just how it happened in the open was just, just kind of blew my mind. Um, but with that, I, I'm just open it up. What do you tell us something that you've never told anybody? Let's, let's dish. Is uh, the, uh, so because of the legal entanglements around, um, around uh, you know fault in a ser in a situation like this there is something that I haven't really mentioned to anyone except maybe Matt uh, in the preparation of his book um, which is the following so everybody agrees that if a system is faulty you can patch it if the core EVM had a bug in it we'd be able to patch it there would be no controversy whatsoever the same way when Bitcoin had its uh, underflow overflow bug you know, people patched it and nobody is really raising a ruckus about it. Uh, somehow everyone thinks, oh, that was that was unintentional, therefore you can fix it. So, so there is a system boundary. And if the bug is on the system side, you should be able to patch it. That's great. Now, the DAO bug was on the other side of the system boundary. But something that I did not make a, a, any no public noise about, but kept deep within my, my own consciousness and informed my decisions was this following simple fact. This bug, even though it was in user space, it stemmed from a failure of the system. It is, as, a, as an operating systems person by birth, if you would, um, I believe that it's the job of the system builder to document all of their interfaces, usages, and quirks. And if you fail to do so, you will end up causing bugs in user space. But the true root cause for that lies on the system side. And so therefore, it was a no-brainer to me that you could do a systemic change to patch a bug like this because you had failed to inform uh, even a highly prominent uh, user like the DAO, the Slocket effort, that there was a quirk here and, and it led to a bug like this. So to me, I think this it was not at all a violation of any contract at all because the error stemmed from people on the system side of this, on the designer side of this, even though the bug manifested itself in application code. So, you know, now that enough time has passed, I think it's, uh, you know, it's okay to discuss this. Nobody's pointing fingers at anybody anymore. Um, so uh, I think uh, documentation is, is, is incredibly important. And this is also another reason why you're not going to see a, a reversal like the DAO again. The bug has been now communicated. The reentrancy issues with the EVM are well known. If tomorrow I write some code and it's got a reentrancy problem, I'm not going to demand an undo operation. It's, it's, it was entirely on me now. But back then, I don't believe it was. So it's at least part of my thinking, and I want to share it with people. Uh, 
know, the white hat. So the Robin Hood group attacked the Dow, right? But uh, get, stealing money is easy. Returning money is a lot of work. And not everyone wanted to continue that work. So the Robin Hood group kind of split up and, and we created the White Hat group who continued uh, kind of taking some risks with, uh, with our legal world uh, in, in this unknown world. And uh, after the hard fork, we ended up with 10% of all ETC in existence. And we didn't know what to do. We weren't sure what was going to happen exactly. And so we flew off to Switzerland and uh, talked and, and created a, a Swiss entity to protect ourselves, right? Uh, and say, it wasn't us, it's this legal fiction over here that's holding all the addresses and doing all the crazy stuff, right? And uh, we really thought that ETC wasn't going to provide any value for anybody. So uh, the, in the long run, and we didn't know how long it would take for everyone to collect their funds. So when we were able to get the ETC out, we decided that it would be best to convert it all to Ether because that was the original currency that people put in. And that was what we would return the currency in when, when it got back. And so we actually spent a couple of days trying to figure out how to slyly, uh, without tanking the ETC price, uh, to convert all of our Ether Classic into uh, into Ether. I never really told anyone about how we did this, but we created some, uh, we worked with a really amazing dev in Switzerland. I just want to give major props to our, our friend. I, can't, I won't say his name, but uh, he knows who he is. And uh, he wrote this beautiful exchange bot where we could push one button and we could sell uh, our ETC on all exchanges at all time at, at one price and bring all exchanges to the same market price. And then our plan was to actually let the price go back, back up a little bit and then dump it again and just like play this yo-yo with the market because we were the whales. Uh, but uh, Polo didn't. Uh, Polo ended up uh, messing up with our plans. Poloniex at the time and locking our funds and that stuff is public but no one really knew that we made all this effort to like we we mixed we we sent uh there was no blockchain explorer for there wasn't a good explorer for ether classic so we used internal transactions to hide where the money came from uh in the, on the etc chain make it really hard to see that it was from the dow hack and just kind of like dis dis we made it disappear in the evm and then pop up and just start Selling. I'll pass it to you. Me in Switzerland with Griff. Why I didn't know about the the I didn't know about the whale thing, part of it, but I knew about the Poloniex part of it because I went to log into my Poloniex and immediately got my account locked because we we're in the same building and Poloniex just shut us all down and we're all sitting there like. What's going on? They were hard after us. They were not happy with us. And I think that, I think we still have a Poloniex account that's still just like, we just never like unlocked because there was no money in it. Like it was, God, the things we've done. at one point right like he was uh he wanted to be the etc whale uh a bitcoin maximalist and he, i'm sure part of the part of the under undercurrent of bitcoiners that wanted to take this as an opportunity to smash ethereum down which is too bad because the bitcoin community in many ways is beautiful there's just certain people in it that you know have want to tear people down to bring themselves up The stuff you're going to reveal in the book. So, um, especially about this attacker, we're all dying to find out how this ends. And thank you guys for such a fascinating conversation. Um, it's just really amazing to hear firsthand from you guys that we're all there and uh, doing this in real time. It's for sure one of the standout chapters in a wild history in crypto. And, uh, Hope everybody enjoyed this and uh, we're out of time. So we'll see you next time.